I remember the first time whenever uh, we learned how to play the guitar, me and my brother David and my stepbrother Mike, and we all learned together. Doug Martin and uh, Danny Helm showed us how to play. And the first time we got to take our guitars to church, I still hadn't figured out how to strum yet. And boy, I was nervous as a June bug in a hen house, man. I mean, it was, I was scared to death. I wouldn't even look out, and I knew all them people, but I wouldn't even look up, man. I was scared to death. And uh, But then when we got, I got a little bit better, and then my, my stepmother and my aunt and uncle, they had a gospel group, and we would go play with them. Man, just look at them people, and I'm thinking, you know, there's so much pressure. You were sweating, I'm sweating profusely. Yeah, yeah. Then after I got used to it, it was nothing to it. Yeah. But one time we got to be on TV. Um, in Hickory on a cable channel up there. Somebody heard my aunt and uncle stepmother sing and they wanted us to come up here and play. I never looked up at the monitor. I was like this the whole time. Never looked up. Now, I didn't want to see me on TV. I, yeah, that's a, I got a face made for radio. I'll be honest with you. So, good to be in God's house. I appreciate every one of y'all being here. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to John chapter 10. As we continue in our What About series, what about our salvation? What about our salvation? You know, salvation is the main theme of the Bible. It is the supreme mission of the Master. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 9, the prophet himself said this, Salvation is from the Lord. 800 years later, after he penned those words, God sent salvation in the literal form of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. In Matthew 1, 21, the angel told Mary, he says, You shall call His name Jesus, which means Jehovah is what? Salvation. Salvation. He says, For He will save. That is a Greek word there for save called sozo. It means to deliver. He will deliver His people from their sin. Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. Sozo. Deliver what, with that which was lost. And while we were while uh, writing the book of Acts, uh, Luke states this in, in chapter 412. He says, There is salvation in no one else. The Greek word for salvation is soteria, which literally means deliverance from the molestation of our enemies. And in context of the verse, it means deliverance is found in no one else. No one else but Christ. Jesus is the deliverer of man's souls. And to finish that verse in Acts 412, he says, For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Sozo. There's a couple extra words that go with that. Delivered, protected, preserved. Paul said in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he says, For grace has been, you have, for by grace you have been saved. Sozo, protected, delivered, preserved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God so that no man may boast. Our, our, our salvation, our deliverance, you understand, and you've heard me say it a thousand times, is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And really, we could stop right there and say the service has been good because that says it all right there. Amen? It says it all. But I do have a few more things I want to share with you. So if you will, please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. And we're going to look at four verses. This is John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30. Jesus said this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And I and the Father are one. Let us pray. Great God, thank you for your mercy and grace and for letting us be here today. Thank you, Father, for, for the, uh, the blessings that you have given us and just for your salvation, Lord, for saving us, for loving us enough to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, I pray that you speak to every heart here today. That this message will resonate in someone's soul. Lord, for those that may see this video, I pray, Father, that you bless them as well. And Lord, it will have an impact in their life. God, everything we say and do, may it be done for your glory. And we ask these things in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen. You can be seated. Now, individual Christians and Christianity as a whole have been referred to as narrow-minded 
and rightfully so, because we have surrendered our lives to the Lordship of Christ. We only want what God's will for our lives. That's, that's all we want. And anything outside of that, we consider it to be sin. Amen? We do. We see that as sin. So, sin separates. It causes a break in communion. It causes us to break, uh, break in fellowship with the Master. The only way to maintain constant, uninterrupted fellowship is to submit our wills totally to His will. Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. He says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Over in Luke's book, book of Luke, he says in 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 24, Jesus says, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and not, will not be able. That Greek word there, for strive is the word agonizomai. This is where we get the word agonize from. It means to contend. It means to fight. It means to uh, do so with strenuous zeal. We know, since we know that salvation is in Christ alone, or by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we know this. But Jesus says we must agonizomai. We must strive to enter through the narrow door. Why is it difficult? It's because we are in a spiritual war. We are in a spiritual war. Even though we have become new creatures in Christ, our flesh is still sinful. It is still inclined to fall. It is still inclined to fail. So every day we have to struggle. We have to strive. We have to agonize with our human pride and our natural love for sin, which is, which is being constantly fed by the opposition, which is none other than who? The devil himself. The devil and his demons. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Knowing that every day is a battle, each of us must settle in our hearts to strive to enter the kingdom, not by our works, of course, but for, by our love and devotion for the one from whom our salvation is given to us threefold. Number one, He justifies us. Christ justifies us. He saves us from the penalty of sin. Secondly, He sanctifying us on a daily basis. Every day, Christ is saving us from the power of sin. And thirdly, one day, bless God, He's going to glorify us. Christ is one day going to save us from the presence and the pleasure of sin, and there we shall ever be before His throne. But this is a matter that we must, that we must settle in each of our own individual hearts. And listen, I can't do it for you, and you can't do it for me. We have to determine on our own whom we're going to serve and to strive to do that. So for our first point concerning our salvation, I want you to look at that first point. It's a personal promise. It's a personal promise. Look at verse 27 in your text. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You know, before Jesus makes this statement, he has a one-on-one -on -one or an encounter, not one-on-one, -on -one, but an encounter with all the Pharisees uh, after this man had been born blind. He had an encounter with these people. And every time he had an encounter with these people, it was always unpleasant. It was always confrontational. The man who had been born blind had been miraculously healed. And rather than rejoice with this man, they excommunicated this man. He, this man had been a burden on society. you think they'd have been happy about that. But no, they cast him out. They excommunicated him from the temple. And all because, here's why, because he would not deny that Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, is the one who healed him. He touched his eyes and he healed him. Shortly after that, the man has his first visual face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus where he confesses him to be Lord and he worshiped him. He worshiped, worshiped Jesus as Lord. Of course, the Pharisees, they witnessed this whole interaction between them. And that's when Jesus says to them, He says, For judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see my, may see, so that those do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. For those who acknowledge and confess their spiritual blindness, they will see the light of the world. But those who have fooled themselves into thinking that they can see without the light of the world, they're the ones who are going to remain blind. Of course, these pompous Pharisees responded back, you know, they asked, we're not blind also, are we? Well, surely not us. We're the spiritual elite. But Jesus said to them, He says, if you were blind, you would have no sin. In other words, if you would confess that you were spiritually blind, you'd be forgiven. 
John Calvin wrote this. He said, He is blind who, aware of his blindness, seeks a remedy to care for his disease. In this way, the meaning will be, if you will acknowledge your disease, it would not altogether be incurable. But now, because you think you're in perfect help, health, you continue in your desperate state. Now, y'all have heard this said before. There's some people that know everything and think they know everything. What's that? You can't tell them nothing. You can't tell them a thing. They won't listen to, what, they won't listen to anything. They won't listen to reason because they have all the answers. Well, this was the Pharisees. Jesus said, but since you say we see, your sin remains. Since they were unwilling to acknowledge their blindness, their spiritual blindness, and they still claim to be able to, uh, still claim to, be able to see, spiritually speaking, they remained unforgiven and incurable. And in response to their last statement, Jesus, here's what he does. He gives them the parable of the sh good shepherd. Now, since he's at the temple, it's quite possible that he's looking at the holding pens of the sheep that are being held in reserve for those needing to offer up sacrifice. So he conveniently uses them as an illustration. The Lord said in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Then he puts forth all his own. He goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Now right out of the gate, in verse 1, this is an indictment toward the Pharisees. They are, these are the thieves and robbers that he's talking about. Because why? They refuse to enter through the door. Who is the door? Who does the door represent? That's right. The door represents Christ. Psalm 118.20 says, This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. As Jesus said in Matthew 7.13, Enter through the narrow gate. Enter through the narrow gate. John 10, 7 says Jesus, here's what he says. So Jesus said to them again, uh, again, this is like he's saying, look here boys, I've told you humpteen times and you still won't listen. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. You must come through me if you want to be a part of the fold. Now here's the message. Every Christian salvific moment involves a personal one-on-one -on -one encounter with the Lord. God the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts and He draws us to His Son. Jesus said in 6, John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And then He says several chapters later in John 14, 6, He says, No one comes to the Father but through me. One salvation includes a personal involvement with the Trinity. In Acts chapter 16, so Paul shares the gospel with these group of ladies down by the river. We've been studying this in, in verse by verse study in Acts on Wednesday nights. We uncovered this. This is what happened. In verse 14 it says a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God was listening and here's the part I want you to listen to. It said this, the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Her salvific moment was personal. It was between her and the Master. And here you see the work of the Trinity the Holy Spirit quickened her dead soul and it made her alive together with Christ and by God's grace she was saved. She heard the efficacious call of the Savior and she knew His voice and she responded to Him. Now before I get too far there's a reference made here concerning the doorkeeper. Jesus said in John 10 3, He said to him the doorkeeper opens now underline that part. If you got it your Bible's open just underline that part. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now different commentators give different explanations as to who this doorkeeper is. Some say it's John the Baptist. Some say it's Moses. The Roman Catholic Church says it's St. Peter. Well, all of them are wrong. It's neither one of these people. 18th century theologian John Gill had it pegged right. He said, This intends God the Father from whom Christ as man and mediator derives His authority and by whom is let into and invested with the office as shepherd of the sheep. What does Gill mean? It means what Galatians 4.4 4 says when the fullness of time came, it was God the Father, the doorkeeper, who sent forth His Son. Y'all follow me? Y'all still with me? Okay. God is the only one who had the authority to let the shepherd come in to call His sheep. 
Christ is the good shepherd. He is the only one qualified to lead the sheep who he knows by name. He is on a first name basis with those who are his own. John, Jesus said in John 10, 4, when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Now here's a, here's a couple of examples of what I mean by that. In Mark chapter 2, verse 14, it says, As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and he followed him. Now as far as I know, as far as we know today, uh, Levi, who is also known as Matthew, never had a personal encounter with Christ until that day. He may have heard him preach. He may have heard his name called. He may have heard somebody talk about this new rabbi from Nazareth. But as far as I know, they never had a personal encounter until that day. And when that day came, he was drawn to the Father, and he went through the Son to be reconciled to the Father. Let me say that again. He was drawn by the Father to come to the Son, and He went through the Son to be reconciled to the Father. His salvation was personal. He was called. He was convicted. He was cleansed. He was converted, and He was controlled by the Master from that point on. Henry Blackaby made this comment. He said, quote, There is something about Jesus' voice that resonates in the heart of His people. The longer we walk with Him, the more recognizable and distinctive His voice should become to us. That's right. Another example of his sheep knowing his voice would be Mary Magdalene. You know, after the Lord was resurrected that Sunday, there she stood by the empty tomb weeping because she didn't know what had happened to him. She thought somebody had come and stole the body. And she stood there weeping, and the Lord came to her personally and asked her, said, Woman, why do you weep? But she's grieving. She's grieving something terrible. But when Jesus called her by name, she immediately recognized the voice of the Good Shepherd. The sheep hear his voice, and they come to him because they know he cares for them. Isaiah 40 verse 11 says, Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock in his arm, and he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom, and he will gently lead the nursing ewes. Christ is the door by which we enter into our relationship with the Father, and he is the good shepherd whose voice we hear and heed. Both examples, both of those examples line up with what Jesus had to say in John 10, 5. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. But the Master's voice is distinctive, it's recognizable, and it resonated in their hearts. Jesus said in John 27, in our text, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice. The Greek word for hear is the word akuo, which means to give an audience. Does the Master have an audience with you when he speaks to you? Do you stop and do you listen to receive his instructions and to receive his warnings and his chastisements? E.W. Blandy wrote this song. He says, I can hear my Savior calling. Where he leads me, I will follow. Do you hear the Savior's voice? And when you hear the Savior's voice, are you willing to follow him? What does this mean for the believer? His and her salvation it's personal. It's personal. Jesus said, I know them and they follow me. That Greek word for know is the word gnosko. And it speaks of a closeness and an intimacy of the Lord with His people. It's comparable to the husband and wives who have a deep, abiding, intimate relationship with each other. It is along those same lines, but in a greater capacity, that Christians enjoy their relationship with Christ. Jesus said in John 14, 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. And listen to this part. And we will come to Him and make our abode with Him. That Greek word for abode means to literally take up residence. Everything about our salvation and relationship with the Lord is personal. It's personal. Secondly, concerning our salvation, it's the provided promise. Look at verse 28. And I give eternal life to them. Now at, the end of verse, at the end of Ephesians 2, Paul wrote this. He said, it is the gift of God. Specifically speaking, Paul is talking about grace and faith being the gift of God, which are the two main components of salvation. So that being said, salvation is God's gift to mankind. And Jesus said to the woman at the well in, in John 4.10, he says, if you knew the gift of God and who, who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, as I said earlier, the name of Jesus means what? Jehovah is salvation. Salvation had literally presented himself to her. He was standing right there in front of her. And before this moment, she didn't know him. She had never met him personally. But standing before her was the very embodiment of everlasting hope. He was the living water standing right there in front of her. And all she had to do was ask for it. And while she was spiritually dead, 
She could only consider the words of the Lord in a physical sense. But when He revealed Himself to her as a Messiah, as the Messiah, her dead spirit was quickened and He provided her with the living water of salvation that could not be acquired by her own efforts. You know, people think that they have to perform some great extraordinary task or service to be saved. If that were true, then it wouldn't be a gift of God, would it? The story of one such man is found in 2 Kings chapter 5. This is Naaman the Syrian. One of my favorite stories. This guy was a war hero. He, held, he was held in the highest regard by the people and, and by his king. Uh, his position in life was made possible by his great feats on the battlefield. And, he, and his service for king and country was beyond, he exceeded beyond anyone. And he, it brought him fame. It brought him fortune. It made him commander in chief of King Ben-Hadad's army. But all of that notoriety, all of that fame, all of that fortune could not keep him from getting that disease called leprosy. And he desperately wanted a cure. And he was willing to do anything it took, any kind of means it took to get rid of this thing. But he gets the cure, but not the way he expects it to be. By the sovereign power and grace of God, God provided for this proud pagan Gentile good counsel, physical healing, and most importantly, I believe, salvation. And he did so by using what this man would have considered the base things in life. He used a little Israelite slave girl. He used an old aging prophet named Elijah. And he also used the muddy Jordan River to humble this man and again I truly believe to save this very proud man and in his pride he would have attempted to perform the greatest feat humanly possible to fix his, his ailment but it wouldn't have changed him physically or spiritually and for Naaman the Syrian salvation became personal and it was provided by the sovereign will of God that day Thirdly, concerning our salvation, it's a permanent promise. Look at the middle of verse 28. And they will never perish. So in regards to Naaman's physical healing, 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 14 says, So he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Physically, he was an, an improved person. He was an improved version of a person. His flesh was like the flesh of a little child. He was clean from head to toe. However, over the course of time, Naaman's physical body began to wear down, and Naaman died. He went back to the dust of the earth. But spiritually speaking he was permanently he became permanently a new creature in Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.17 he says, Therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold new things have come. That's why it's impossible for a true born again Christian to lose their salvation. The new creation, if that was the case, the new creation would have to be destroyed. At the moment of our salvation, we're given eternal life in Christ because He has given us, given us His life. And since Christ lives forevermore, then our salvation is permanent. Amen? Amen. That's right. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says, Therefore He is able to also to save forever those who draw near to God through Him, since He he always lives to make intercession for them. To say or suggest or even think that we can lose our salvation is to say that Almighty God is not Almighty. I mean the word Almighty means total power. It means supreme. It means eminent. It means in, preeminent, excuse me, um, invincible, unconquerable. It means omnipotent. Thus to say that the saving power of God is not permanent would be an insult and a slander to the Creator of all things. And yet, there are those who hold this belief. Let me say this. If you're one of those people who think just saying a simple one-time prayer or walking down an aisle uh, to an altar or signing a commitment card makes you a Christian, then I would say to you, yes, you probably could lose your salvation. But if you have fully trusted and placed your faith in the Lordship of Jesus Christ, calling Him Lord and Savior, then the Holy Spirit now abides in you and you are, uh, and He has given you power. He is, he, is, he is the power to save in your life. He has saved your life and you cannot lose your salvation. And here are five, here are five reasons why it's impossible for a true believer to lose their salvation. Number one, true believers have been redeemed. 1 Peter 1, 18-19 says this, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, 
inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. The word redeem refers to a purchase being made, a price being paid. We were purchased at the cost of Christ's death. For a Christian to lose their salvation, God Himself would have to revoke His purchase of that individual whom He paid for with the precious blood of Christ. He would have to revoke that. Number two, true believers have been justified. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. To justify someone is to declare that person righteous. All those who have surrendered to the Lordship of Christ are declared righteous by God. And so for a Christian to lose their salvation, God would have to go back on His Word and undeclare what He has previously declared. And those who have been absolved of their guilt would have to be tried again and found guilty. And God would have to then reverse the sentence handed down from His divine bench. That would cause into question his omnipotence or his, excuse me his omniscience saying God you didn't know that you, do you let that slip by no God didn't let anything slip by number three true believers have been promised eternal life it was Jesus himself who said in John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life the Lord Jesus promised us eternal life in heaven with God. And God promised that if we believed, we would have eternal life. And so for a true Christian to lose their salvation, eternal life would have to be redefined. A Christian is promised to live forever because Christ lived forever. Eternal means what? Eternal. Forever. You'd have to redetermine, you'd have to redefine that word. Fourthly, true Christians, or excuse me, true believers have been marked by God and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14 says this, In him also, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. At the moment of salvation, true believers are marked and are sealed by the Spirit, who is promised to act as a promise, a deposit or guarantee to our heavenly insurance inheritance. The end result of that is that God receives the praise of His glory. And for a Christian to lose their salvation, God would have to erase that mark. He'd have to break the seal, withdraw His Spirit. He'd have to cancel the deposit. He'd break His promise. He would revoke the guarantee. Uh, he would keep the inheritance. He would forego all the praise. And therefore, He would lessen His glory. He's not going to do that. And number five, true believers have been guaranteed glorification. Romans 8 and 30 says this, And these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. So Romans 5 1 says justification is ours at the moment of faith. Romans 8 30 says glorification comes with justification. That means everyone whom God justifies is promised to be glorified. A promise that will be fulfilled when we receive our perfect resurrection bodies in heaven. And if a believer could lose their salvation, that would mean God could not guarantee the glorification for those whom He has predestined and called and justified. In short, Romans 8 30 would be a lie. And he's not a lie. So based on that scriptural evidence alone, a true believer cannot lose their salvation. And most, if not all of what the Bible says to us when we receive Christ would have been invalidated if salvation could be lost. Salvation is a gift of God. And Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says that God's gifts are what? Irrevocable. In the words of one Christian writer, he said this. He said, a Christian cannot be unnewly created. The redeemed cannot be unpurchased. The eternal life cannot be temporary. God cannot renege on His Word. Scripture says that God cannot lie. End quote. Titus 1-2 says, In the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. This has been promised before, before the foundation of the world was ever laid. And finally, concerning our salvation, it's a protected promise. Look at the end of verse 28. Jesus said, no one will snatch them out of my hand. Somebody need to shout amen on that one. That's right. John MacArthur wrote this. He said, nowhere in Scripture is there a stronger affirmation of the absolute eternal security of all true Christians. The security of the believer in salvation does not depend on human effort, but is grounded in the gracious, sovereign election, promise, and power of God. End quote. Two things, and we'll wrap her up. 
our salvation is protected from all foes by the Lord Jesus. And that means both in the physical and spiritual realm. Nothing can rob us or deprive us of our salvation provided in Christ. Through the inspired leading of the Holy Spirit, Paul threw down the gauntlet in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, when he so wonderfully declared this. He said, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And then he references to Psalm 44, 22. He says in verse 36, he says, Just as it is written, For your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen and amen. And every one of us, every one of us here have faced foes at some time or another in life. And rest assured, as the Lord tarries, as He tarries His return, and as long as we walk the face of this earth, we will face them again. And some of y'all might even be facing these, these things right now as we speak. But rest easy, Christian, because you are protected. You're held tightly in the Lord's righteous right hand so that no one will snatch you away. Nothing can snatch us away. The Greek word for snatch is harpazo, which means to seize or to carry off by force. Satan would love to do that. But guess what? He can't do it. John G. Butler said, To deny the security of the believer is to call Christ a liar and to declare that his promises cannot be trusted. Secondly, our salvation is protected from all foes by the Father. Jesus said in John 29, in that next verse, verse 29, He says in our text, He says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. The Greek word for greater is the word megos, which means that in relation and in rank, the Father supersedes all creatures in every category in authority and power and virtue and ability, and so goes the list. I mean, it's a long list. He, he, he supersedes everything. He is the great I Am. He is the great I Am. Amen? He is the great I Am. John Phillips said, There is something magnificent, magnificent about the picture of the Lord wrapping His omnipotent hand around us, and of the Father wrapping His own almighty hand around His. Thus, we are ensphered in Christ, in God. That imagery right there is phenomenal. Imagine two siblings holding hands, and over, you know, the older over the younger, and then the Father takes His hand and He wraps around both of theirs. That's a wonderful thought. You know, my daddy had catcher's mitts for hands. I mean, he had big old hands. They were strong, and they were heavy, and I can promise you they were heavy paws because I felt them on my rear end more than one time. Yeah, and, and more than I want to count. And, and I know I've told this story countless times, but it's a great illustration. I was four and a half years old when my great-grandmother Bessie Stevens passed away. And it was in 1968, February 1968. I'll never forget it. There was ice on the ground. It would cover the ground as we were walking to the cars <coughs> from, the, from the graveside. My daddy had a hold of me by his big old right hand. He wouldn't let me go. I wanted him to let me go so I'd go sliding down the hill, but old Donnie Hems wasn't going to let me go. He held on to me. He wasn't going to have any of that. He, man, he had a Superman grip on me, and there was no getting away from him. And I didn't understand that. Man, just let me go. Let me go have fun. But see, I understand now why he did it. He loved me because he didn't want me to get hurt. He didn't want me to get run over by the cars leaving the parking lot. He loved me that much. That's enough said right there. That's what God does for us. You know, as we speak, our Heavenly Father and His Son are doing the very same things. Jesus said in verse 30, I and the Father are one. Two distinct persons of one essence and one commitment, and they're holding us with their hands to protect and preserve His flock, His church, His bride that His Father has given to Him. And Jesus said in John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me. Friend, the Lord is eternally committed to the protection and preservation of everyone who belongs to Him. So now the only question to ponder is, are we all sheep of His flock? Do we know His voice when He calls us? And when we hear His voice, how do we respond? Do we follow Him or do we reject Him? You know, there are only two choices. You either love Christ and you either call Him Lord... And that's evident by your submission and your obedience to His will. Or do you reject His presence in your life? A lot of people, you know, say they, love, they, say they call themselves a believer, and they use that word so frivolously. They say, I'm a Christian. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I, I go to church. But do they really mean it? 
When you look at their life, their life doesn't say they do. Their life preaches another story. It doesn't line up with what the Bible says we're supposed to do. And some of them say, well, you're being, a judge, you're being judgmental. Look here. When you see it happening before you, you have no other choice but to call it what it is. No, I cannot see the depths of that person's heart. But Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's inside is going to come outside. And if it doesn't line up with what they say, you have to call a question right there. Amen. You have to call a question right there. So where do we all stand? That's the question. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God, thank you for your mercy and grace and for letting us be here today. Thank you for everything that you've said and done in my life and for all the things that you're doing for us. Uh, Father, I pray that this message will speak to someone's heart today and that everybody here, uh, Lord, will do a work in their life. And for those that see this video, I pray, Father, that you would uh, impact their souls as well. Uh, Lord, have your will and your way in our lives today. And then when we walk out of this place today, Lord, do we lift, you up, lift up the name of Jesus. For you're the name above all names. And that's what we need to do, share the gospel with everyone we know, because the end is, is drawing nigh. Lord, we ask all these things in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen.